Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled, The Southern Home Front in World War II. World War II is usually considered a pivotal time in the history of the U.S. and the South, especially in regards to economic and racial transformation. Some scholars have posited that World War II launched the U.S. into the new era of economic modernism and jump-started the Civil Rights Movement. While there is ample evidence that the South of 1970 was very different than that of 1945, such progress was not linear. Instead, there was a lag in both economic and racial advancement for a few years after World War II, but by the mid-1950s, both the economy and civil rights movement had begun to flourish. This lecture will cover what occurred on the home front during World War II. We'll discuss the presence of the U.S. military, particularly the impact bases had on the economy and society, general economic changes from war investments, new roles for women outside the home, and how African Americans fared in the military. A later lecture will discuss some of the activities that preceded the Civil Rights Movement of 1954. Let's look now at the presence of the U.S. military in the history of World War II and the South. To prosecute World War II, the military eventually saw 15 million men and women serving in uniform. About one-third of these volunteered, with the other two-thirds drafted. Women were, of course, all volunteers. Of these 15 million, about 4 million were Southerners, and 400,000 were African Americans, not all from the South. 4,000 African-American women were in uniform. A great exchange of people occurred as a result of the war. Out-migration from the South for military-industrial purposes was about 7 million total, but approximately 6 million men and women from outside the region trained or emigrated for work. We'll speak of economic changes and the war experiences of African Americans in a moment, but one of the most important changes that occurred because of the war was the sighting of military bases in the South. When it came time to site military bases, we see a similar dynamic to that of World War I, when the South received 17 of 32 training camps. Beginning in 1940, the South received 1,153 of almost 3,000 military installations, or 38% of the total number, as well as 42% of total expenditures, $3.1 billion in the South of the $7.3 billion spent across the nation. Of the 11 former Confederate states plus Kentucky, the number of bases ranged from 27 in Kentucky to 300 in Texas for a median number of 96 and a mean of 69. Mean, of course, is the number that divides the top half of recipients from the bottom. As Daniel Hutchinson writes in his dissertation, the, quote, War Department's process of establishing military bases quickly devolved into a struggle between harried military officers, community boosters, and meddling politicians, unquote, after the U.S. declared war. Because the South had so many bases in World War I, and it kept its congressional representatives in office long enough that many of them gained considerable clout, the South got a lion's share of federal investment again. Regardless of the excitement of gaining a base for its economic impact, there were losers to consider. Often, bases took over thousands of acres of farmland, and farmers were displaced through relocation or payment. If a landowner lost land, tenants were out of a job. William Link notes that 25,000 people were displaced to make way for southern bases and military manufacturing plants that took up over 710,000 acres. Getting a base affected the local economy in ways similar to World War I. Abilene, Texas hosted Camp Barkley, training infantry and enjoyed not only the $14 million price tag, but much of the $1 million monthly payroll, which was equivalent to $16.6 .6 million in 2017 dollars. We can extrapolate those Abilene numbers to many other camps. 
not all military bases trained infantry. The Army built dozens of Army Air Force training stations in the warmer areas of the country. One of these was Napier Field in southeast Alabama. The images you see here are from a Royal Air Force pilot cadet, D.S.S. Frazier, who was one of the many RAF pilots who trained in the much safer skies of the U.S., where their life expectancy was longer than under the eyes of the Luftwaffe back home. You can see Cadet Frazier in the upper right, standing in front of his Fairchild trainer. We're unsure of Frazier's fate, but he must have survived the war, as this small collection of Napier Field memorabilia was sent to Troy University in 2012 from his estate in England. Another important military contribution to consider is the presence of prisoner of war camps in the southern U.S. As you can see, the Army scattered POW camps all across the region. There were base camps surrounded by smaller branch camps concentrated along the coastal plain of South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama, as well as up the Mississippi River, particularly the Arkansas Delta, and in Texas and Oklahoma. All told, there were 244,000 German and Italian POWs in the South. The Army provosts weeded out the hardened Nazis, secluding them in camps in Oklahoma. And while there were some daring escape attempts, the majority of POWs, many captured in the North African Campaign of 1942, were not particularly unhappy with their treatment. That doesn't mean Americans were happy with their treatment. As racially white, POWs often received better public accommodations than local African Americans, riding in the front of buses and sitting on the main floor of theaters. Some whites complained that POWs ate better and were better clothed than white Americans who worked at the camps. POWs often worked in agricultural pursuits and could be requisitioned by local farmers to help with planting and harvesting. World War II brought unprecedented growth in the economy and industry to the U.S. South but we should take lightly the interpretations that say this injection of federal and private money led to linear long-term growth. As geographer Robert Lewis notes in his 2007 article, World War II Manufacturing and the Post-War Southern Economy, published in the Journal of Southern History, the South enjoyed a peak in manufacturing during the war years, but quickly reverted to its older agricultural-based economy. Much of this reversion came because war industries cannot be converted to civilian use. For example, the automobile plants in Detroit and Ohio could convert back to producing cars that civilians wanted. But just how much demand was there for high explosives from the munitions plant in Childersburg, Alabama? The only ongoing industry established by wartime and military needs in the South was the Gulf Coast petrochemical industry, oil extraction and refining. This is not to say that the Southern economy of 1970 wasn't far different than it had been in 1940, but there was a post-war slump in the Southern economy that mirrored what had happened in the early 1920s. What reversed that slump? was the remilitarization of the South to prosecute the Cold War and support the global U.S. presence that came with superpower status, as well as national and global economic changes that incorporated the U.S. South. Nevertheless, the South enjoyed a dramatic uptick in its economy during the war, enough that we can say with confidence that the war ended the Great Depression. The South did not receive the same kind and amount of industrial investment as it had military bases, and oddly, for the same reasons. Bases needed land away from cities and a large, unskilled workforce, which the South had. But industry retooled existing plants and expanded only when it had to. But the South did get some investment. The U.S. government created a secret town in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, part of the TVA development to create the nuclear fuel used in Los Alamos, New Mexico, to build the atomic bomb. The population grew to 75,000 by 1945. The Army liked the area because it was a long, narrow valley that might contain the spread of atomic materials if they exploded. 
Oak Ridge National Laboratory continues on this site. Munitions and high explosives plants grew in Childersburg, Alabama and Kingsport, Tennessee, both rural enough to minimize any destruction from untoward accidents. DuPont operated in Childersburg from 1941 through 1945 and employed 14,000 people. DuPont also secretly produced the heavy water needed by the Manhattan Project there. The Holston Ordnance Works in Kingston, Tennessee produced the super high explosive RDX for use in anti-submarine weapons and for mass bombardments. World War II was an aircraft war, so the Army Air Forces needed fighters and bombers in extraordinary numbers. Once existing aviation plants were at maximum capacity, contractors built new plants in the South, each employing thousands of workers, many of them women. You can see the list here. Bell Aviation produced B-29s, the largest bomber of the war, in Georgia. Consolidated and North American produced fighters like the P-51 in Texas. Curtis Wright, the nation's largest producer, built the P-40 fighter and the C-76 transport in Louisville. And Voltee produced A-31 dive bombers for the British and Australian Air Forces and a different version for the Americans in Nashville. Just as in World War I, the U.S. Navy and Merchant Marine were not prepared for World War II. Along with almost every other port in the nation, southern ports were pressed into service, none against their will. The Hampton Roads area of Virginia, that is Newport News and Norfolk, became not only a major shipbuilding area, but one of the most significant debarkation points for troops headed to Europe. Charleston, Savannah, and Tampa all built merchant ships, but the Gulf ports of Mobile, Pascagoula, New Orleans, and Houston grew exceptionally large. In Mobile, Ads Co., that had been very productive in the Great War, received dozens of contracts for large merchantmen and warships, and the Waterman Shipping Company, which got its start by buying remaindered ships from World War I, revived the Chickasaw Yards under the name Gulf Shipbuilding Corporation, building cargo ships, minesweepers, and destroyers. In Pascagoula, Mississippi, Robert Ingalls used Birmingham, Alabama steel to build Liberty ships, cargo vessels like the SS John W. Brown shown here. Ten shipyards in the Houston Orange area of Texas also launched 63 Liberty-class cargo ships, wooden minesweepers, and a variety of large escort vessels. Brown Shipbuilding launched a dozen submarine chasers, 61 destroyer escorts, and 25 landing craft. But the most colorful and the most World War II specific story is that of Higgins Industry of New Orleans that built the landing craft, which we're all familiar with. These are shallow draft barges with a drop front to rapidly discharge troops and vehicles. Designed for the bayous of Louisiana, they were perfect for the new world of amphibious warfare. From Nebraska, Higgins adopted a very New Orleans attitude toward his workforce, diversification and skills-based advancement. Higgins Industries grew to be the largest manufacturer in the U.S. with 85,000 employees and $350 million in U.S. government contracts during World War II. It produced over 250 landing crafts, PT boats, and other light wooden craft. Between direct federal investment in war supplies and all the spin-off industries that developed, the southern economy experienced tremendous growth, just as the general U.S. economy did. Investment in manufacturing plants and payrolls was over $4.5 billion from 1941 through 1945, with 3 million people at work in war industries. Southern wages climbed by 139% over those years, and industrial capacity grew by 40%. It's no wonder that historians have considered World War II to be the jumping off point for the post-war economy of the South. Agriculture grew as well. Farm income climbed by 300%. 
Cotton production rose to 10 million bales per year, with cotton prices doubling. Domestic industry was able to absorb the new production levels, but was not able to dent the so-called carryover, that is, previous year's cotton that had not yet been sold. Soybean and peanut production doubled as well, mostly for oil. But there were signs of trouble for agricultural employment. Americans' almost religious belief in technological solutions to problems, which both helped win World War II and send society into bizarre directions, started to replace labor-intensive farming with capital-intensive farming at increasing speeds. Federal agricultural policy of the 1930s that favored big factory farms and efficiency over smallholders, and which killed the Farm Security Administration by 1942, was realized in the 1950s with a push from World War II. Other problems arose with such dramatic growth in industry. As they had in World War I, Cities that housed bases or manufacturing plants became severely overcrowded, which led to skyrocketing housing costs, substandard housing, substandard infrastructure like water, sewage, and transportation, increases in vice and crime, and severe pollution. In the countryside, displacement of farmers and tenants because of military bases and expanding industry was a problem, as was disruption of life overall. The South was generally a very conservative society that did not incorporate changes readily, but World War II brought a tidal wave of change that the South was not really ready to accept gracefully. One significant change was the role of women. By the middle of the war years, middle-class Southern women began to leave home to go to work in manufacturing and service industries. Norman Rockwell's illustration for the Saturday Evening Post of May 29, 1943 began our current romanticization of Rosie the Riveter to represent the 17 million women in the workforce during World War II. But the Rosie shown here, modeled on 19-year-old telephone operator Mary Doyle Keith, was not only idealized, she's actually much larger than the model, but carries a building rivet gun rather than the much smaller metal plate rivet gun. Most women who riveted did so in aircraft plants. Women who built ships welded and in the Pacific Northwest were dubbed Windy the Welder. There were more Windies than Rosies overall. Working class women had always worked, often in domestic service, retail, and light industry. After the commercialization of typewriters and professionalization of some knowledge occupations, middle-class women began to work outside the home, many for only a few years. The beau ideal of the 20th century was the nuclear family with a husband who made enough to provide a decent livelihood, a wife who maintained the household, and kids. But with so many men in the military and increased demand for workers, industry campaigned to get middle-class women to enter the manufacturing workforce. The We Can Do It poster you see here is the most famous artifact of that campaign. It was produced by Howard J. Miller for Westinghouse Electric Company in 1943. Compare it and the Rockwell Rosie. Rockwell's worker is smudged with dirt, clothed in masculine overalls and shoes, and she happens to be resting her foot on a copy of Mein Kampf, She's muscular and used to heavy labor with a 90-pound rivet gun. Miller's Rosie is proud of her work, but much more feminine. She's clean, in a clean blouse, wearing both makeup, note her eyelashes and brows, and stylishly coiffed. Her message was aimed at middle-class women. Enter the workforce, it's not for men only. Southern women did so. The number of Southern women working outside the home grew from about 4 million in 1940 to over 5 million by 1945. The demographics of such women changed too. 
Many more were middle-class housewives in 1945 than in 1940, though many industrial workers had changed jobs from service industries, retail, and secretarial work to industrial work because of better pay and conditions. African-American women fled domestic service, which was underpaid, dehumanizing, and servile for industrial work. Although African-Americans did not command exactly equal wages and conditions as whites did in the war industries, President Roosevelt's Executive Order 8802 had taken a step in that direction. Fearful of A. Philip Randolph's July 1941 threat to bring up to 100,000 blacks to march on Washington, D.C., FDR made it federal policy to pay African-American workers and white workers equally on federal projects. His Fair Employment Practices Committee was weak, but a good step. Because it operated under continuing executive orders rather than congressional authority, it had neither enforcement mechanisms nor an adequate budget. But the FEPC was one manifestation of the rise of African American resistance to Jim Crow, at least at the federal level. African Americans saw opportunity to displace Jim Crow in the disruption caused by the war. So while civilians pressed and organized for civil rights, others joined military units and challenged long-held stereotypes about black soldiers. Although African American community leaders in World War I convinced themselves that they could gain first-class citizenship merely by unfailing cooperation in the U.S. efforts, black leaders in World War II were not nearly as self-deceived. There was, as sociologist Howard Odom noted, quote, great force and vitality, unquote, among the black population. It was this new attitude brought about by opportunity and the Depression-era New Deal chipping away at economic dependency that animated the black community. A number of African-American legal and political organizations arose during the war, two with exceptionally long tenures and that worked during the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s are the NAACP and CORE. The NAACP was founded in 1909 as a biracial group to advance civil rights. W.E.B. Du Bois edited its journal, The Crisis, until 1934. It expanded in World War I then all but collapsed in the 1920s. It arose again in the 1940s with the establishment of its legal defense fund and a new strategy, used the court system to achieve racial equality, which by then had begun to mean racial integration. The war in this new strategy turned the NAACP into a grassroots organization. Its chief litigator was Thurgood Marshall, who argued the Brown v. Board case in 1954 and was the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court. CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was another organization that gained traction with the war. Famous for organizing the 1961 Freedom Rides, CORE began in 1942 in Chicago. Like the NAACP in its early years, CORE membership was two-thirds white and one-third black. It differed from NAACP by committing to nonviolent direct action to counter segregation. Its founders formed a leadership cadre for actions in the 1960s in particular, but its roots were in the new attitude of blacks in World War II. Indicative of this attitude was the Double V campaign. Not content to suffer racial discrimination and humiliation without resistance, but disorganized and without power, African Americans adopted the symbolic double V for victory over fascism abroad and victory over Jim Crow at home. All of these things, and others I've not covered in this lecture, form the bedrock on which the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was built. Many of the people associated or influenced by these stirrings in World War II went on to take leadership roles in those later struggles. Other African Americans served in the armed forces. Only 22% of African American soldiers and sailors were in combat units. The Army had many segregated service units. The Navy allowed blacks to serve only in menial capacities, often as mess crew, and the Marines did not allow blacks to join. The 4,000 black women who joined the military were in support units, like the 855 women of the 688 
8 Central Post Directory Battalion that was the only all-female, all-black battalion sent overseas in the war. They sorted an enormous backlog of mail in England when they arrived in 1945 and did the same in France, delivering some letters that were three years old. Combat units included the 92nd Infantry Division, the Buffalo Soldiers, who were deployed to Italy in 1944 and fought their way up the boot. Much later, two of their number received the Medal of Honor. The 93rd Division went to the Pacific Theater, where they worked as combat support troops, usually relieving companies of garrison duty. They did see combat and captured the highest ranking Japanese general taken prisoner during the war. There were three African-American tank battalions, the 758, the 761, and the 784. The 758 provided fire support in the mountains of Italy. The 784 taught tank infantry tactics and fought one pitched battle with the breakthrough of American forces in Germany. There they lost 23 tanks, 31 dead, and 93 missing or wounded. The 761 saw the most combat, deploying to Europe in October of 1944. As part of the 3rd Army, they served without relief for 183 days, suffered a 50% casualty rate, and lost 71 tanks in combat. They were the first elements of the 3rd Army to link up with our Soviet allies on May 6, 1945 in Austria and won 11 silver stars, 69 bronze stars, and 296 purple hearts. Reluctantly, the Army Air Forces created a flying unit for African Americans who were initially stationed at Tuskegee's airfield, earning the nickname Tuskegee Airmen. Their pilots were deployed in four fighter squadrons and one bomber group. The first squadron to see action was the 99th Pursuit Squadron, deployed to North Africa in 1942, then to Italy. In February 1944, it had linked up with the others in the 332 fighter group. Their main mission was to escort bombers, and although recent examination of military records busted the myth that they never lost a bomber to enemy aircraft, their total loss of 25 was minuscule compared to other units. The 477 Bomber Group was formed in 1943, flying the B-24 Liberator Heavy Bomber. There were so many pilots and so few navigators and engineers, largely because AAF generals did not want blacks to train in those roles, that the group trained crews prior to deployment. Their unit was disbanded in 1944, its personnel transferred to the 112 AAF base unit with a similar mission of training. World War II was a boon to the U.S. South, and though it did not launch it directly into post-war prosperity, it did give the South some of the social and cultural capacity to seize prosperity when prosperity came back. The war ended the Great Depression though with great travail for the four million who served in uniform and the other millions who worked in industry or left the South in another iteration of the Great Migration. Military bases and POW camps brought direct federal funding to the South, and war manufacturing not only brought billions of dollars of investment, but shifted workers from low-wage jobs to higher-wage work. Women who already worked flocked to the new jobs, and when they were not enough, Industry recruited middle-class Rosie the Riveters and Wendy the Welders, black and white. African-American leaders at the national level used the dislocation of the war to extract better conditions for their community, and civil rights organizations saw both significant growth and a spirit of activism they had not encountered before. African-American troops, most from the South, served under the same conditions as their white comrades, with some prejudice and discrimination thrown in. Their successes inspired pride in the community, which set the stage for the early civil rights movement. This then ends the lecture, and as always, thanks for your attention.